A lot of us have a lot, or maybe grow a bit of veg, but I don't know whether you've ever tried wandering off into the woods and eating what you find. They call it foraging, don't they? You have to be careful, but there are people who do this professionally. And Tom is out with one of them this morning, aren't you? You're going to be learning some new skills. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Annabelle, you sound almost shocked. <laughs> I do sometimes learn new stuff. <laughs> well, Every now um, yeah, and then. You, you join me in a beautiful part of Northamptonshire. I'm on the outskirts of the village of Gayton, kind of between Gayton and Milton Mulsar, actually. You might hear trains rumble past because the, uh, the West Coast Main Line is probably only about 200 metres from where I'm standing. But if you stand with your back to the railway line, what you are greeted by is gently rolling landscape with a heavy dew on the grass, lots of mature trees of various types in various shades now that autumn's upon us. And this is land that belongs to the man that I'm with this morning. His name is Richard Morby. Um, he is a forager. He runs a company called Forage Frolics where he can teach you how to wander off into the woods and safely identify the stuff that is safe to eat as opposed to the stuff that's going to kill you. Because you do have to be careful when you're going out foraging. But woodlands are, if you know where to find it, chock full of edible stuff. And so this morning we're going to talk about some of that and we are going to be making a pizza out of the stuff that we find and Richard's with me. Good morning. Good morning. Um, how did you get started in foraging? Where did it begin for you? Um, so partly it was um, because I grew up around the land as a, as a child. I grew up with uh, being taught the names of the trees, the names of the plants, but that was only one side of it. It was when I was about 23 that I, uh, um, I changed my diet. I had a, quite a stressful year the year before and I kind of let go of the way that I was eating and kind of developed a tooth cavity. So I thought, OK, I'm going to look at alternative sources. I don't want to just get another filling because that's not going to fix the core of the issue. And um, so I, overnight I just kind of changed my diet. I went more of a primal paleo, source better foods. So I'm a and primal paleo? Prim, primal kind of slash paleo, but not completely because I had things like raw milk involved. And so what does that mean? What's a primal um, paleo? Primal diet? or paleo is more of kind of like eating less uh, refined and processed foods really like kind of eating more eating more naturally in a sense i didn't really follow what they say in the book so i kind of took my own view of it and uh, and i say okay. i just kind of ate more locally sourced better foods and um and it was just when i was walking through the field one day i was just i was just looking at the wild plants in a different light i, I think it may have been because of the way that i was eating my body cultures changed a little bit and I just started looking at nettles in a strange way, thinking, okay, I think I can eat you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's and, supposed to just being stung, yes. And, um, and so it just kind of was a roller coaster journey after that because I already could identify a lot of plants. So I was just kind of suddenly realizing, okay, these are edible. And I started incorporating them into my diet um, rather quickly. So, <laughs> what is a typical, on a typical day, like yeah. today, for example, what would you have for lunch? Um, that depends. Um, if I feel like I need something more substantial, I'll go out and um, pick a few things. Like as I say, we're doing the wild pizza. This time of year, I'm a big fan of wild sourdough pizzas. Um, so what I would probably do is go out and pick uh, pick a few nettles, dandelions, sorrel. This is all the things we'll go and pick later on for the pizza. Um, and then I'll, um, I've already made whore ketchup, so if I need to make more, I'll do that. Um, and I use whore ketchup as a base instead of tomato hawthorn, ketchup. Isn't hawthorn, it? yes. Wow. And um, I'll use that as a pizza base. Um, some foraged mushrooms that I've foraged before, I'll rehydrate, put them on the pizza. Um, of course, you can't forget the cheese. Uh, put all the other plants on top and then bake it, and that's, that's probably what I'd have for lunch. Wow. I mean, this sounds amazing. I, mean, I mentioned that you have to know what you're doing because there is stuff in the woods that you very definitely shouldn't eat. So, uh, yeah, did you have someone to guide you? Uh, not really myself. I, I've kind of, I'm, I'm quite uh, adept when it comes to kind of learning my own things. So I, I, I can. Uh, I'm quite quick to learn what you can eat and what you can't eat. Same with anything else, it applies to everything that I've done in life. It's just kind of I, I just take it on board and I kind of do a lot of research myself. And, um, it still requires some bravery, though, doesn't it? I mean, um, I'll be honest, if I was given a book and told there's some stuff in that woods that's safe and there's some well, stuff all, in that all, woods... All you've got to know is um, essentially what looks like the thing that you're eating. If it's... Uh, look, Have a look in books or have a look... Uh, or even speak to a, speak to an experienced forager and, um, and see if you can find anything that looks similar that's poisonous. Um, and as long as there's no lookalikes, um, say for example the mustard family, yeah, so it, once you can identify certain plant families, um, 
it's quite easy to kind of get into it and just uh, mm. find find certain edibles. Um, you me- I mentioned that you run courses uh, under yeah. your company Forage Frolics. So when people come to see you for the day, what do you hope that they take away with them? Um, mainly, I'd like to help them in- install some of the confidence so they can go out and forage themselves. It's kind of uh, for me, it's more about come to me as few times as you can so that you've developed the skills. It's kind of yeah. I don't, don't want to keep having people coming back to kind of just show them plants i want them to develop the skills so that they can go away and feel more confident they'll learn the, how to identify plant through senses um as well as looking at the book yeah um and uh as i say yeah just go just go away and feel more confident to pick your pick your own food even if it's just nettles and dandelions and all the simple things uh, that's where it starts this is really fascinating stuff. And it's quite, I mean, it is quite an unusual lifestyle, isn't it? <laughs> it can be. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's a way, that, I mean, it, it's, defi- it's definitely kind of, uh, it's definitely it's definitely catching on in the, in like, in bigger areas now. There's, there's, I've, I've seen it a lot on the mainstream TV, for example. Yeah. Like, there's a lot more foraging going on. Um, so, no, it's not as extreme as it used to be. Um, now you, I mean, of all the things that people have at their homes, I mean, you have a nature reserve at your home, <laughs> yeah. you? which helps for this. Uh, I mean, it helps in some sense, but there's so there's so many public areas you can forage, especially around Northamptonshire and anywhere that's got a lot of rural um, rural suburbs and whatnot. So, yeah. so th- th- there's loads you can forage, and you don't even have to step far out of your doorstep. Okay. Well, look, I'm I'm looking forward to learning about <laughs> it. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of foraging, Annabelle. Uh, we're going to wow. prepare a pizza. We're going to cook. I know. We're going to cook the pizza. I mean, look, I'll be honest. Kind of the bit that my stomach's excited about is eating pizza. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot in the process <laughs> as well, isn't there? And I have a feeling that, um, yeah, I think this might be one of the mornings when I come away having actually learned something. Yeah. Look, I mean, you were very excited about having grown your first courgette earlier this year, weren't you? So look at you now. Haven't you grown up, you Tom? I feel both kind of warm and patronised. Thanks. <laughs> That's perfect. It's just what I was meaning. Let's head back to Tom, and this would be an apt tune for him this morning. Because he is spending the morning with someone who really is living the good life. He is foraging, aren't you, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. What is foraging? Well, it is essentially wandering off into the woods and eating the things that are edible. I'm with someone. Don't worry. I'm not just I'm not just chancing my arm. That would have the potential to go very badly wrong. The man I'm with is Richard Morby. He lives on the outskirts of Gayton. He actually has a nature reserve at his house, which does rather help. But uh, he runs courses. He runs a school called Forage Frolics. You can find them online. He has a Facebook page, Instagram, and all that kind of jazz. He can teach you the principles of foraging. Um, I'm going to talk to him again in a moment. First, uh, we went off for a wander a little earlier on to try and find some stuff we can eat. Look around here now, and I, I couldn't identify any of this. I mean, those are nettles, right? I get that. Yeah. And these are thistles. Yeah. But that's it. I mean, I couldn't tell you what anything else is. Right, so what we're, what we're coming up to um, right now is uh, one of the big bases of what we're going to be using for the pizza. Um, so do you recognise the, the bush with the red berries? So you mentioned hawthorn ketchup. Yes. I'm guessing given that ketchup is red, that these berries are hawthorns. <laughs> That's right, yes. This is, this is, uh, this is hawthorn. Uh, it's very, very, very hard to kind of mistake it for anything else, um, especially because of the... Uh, it's got your thorns, it's got these little... These little berries that almost resemble apples, yep. if you look at them closely, and um, they just don't have the same sweetness as apples. No. Uh, so I don't want to eat one just straight. Well, off you can it. eat it if you want to and try it, but if you probably won't be as. Uh, it's probably not the best thing to introduce you to wild food. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's not terrible. It's just like a tasteless apple. Okay. But don't eat the seed. Oh, I see what you mean. A tasteless apple. You've not sold it to me. No, but, it, uh, you know, actually, it did taste pretty nice. It was a subtle flavour. It had the consistency of apple, just a lot smaller. Um, Richard's with me. He's sitting uh, just inside the threshold of his foraging caravan. <laughs> and, um, Richard, we, you said you were really keen to talk about the principles of foraging. So, so what are the guiding rules of it? Uh, well, essentially, they're not so much rules. They're more like guidelines um, just to kind of, firstly, just to help you kind of forage a bit more safely, um, but also just to... Uh, also to take care of the land around you etc so i'll just get straight straight into it um so first first of all um kind of makes sense respect nature um take only what you need um only pick where there is abundance leave and leave plenty for animals regrowth and other people who might 
um, want to enjoy some of nature's bounty. Um, and the fundamentally only harvest if you are 110% certain um, of the food's identity because um, there are there are there are toxic lookalikes to certain plants, especially in the carrot family, um, which is one of the most rewarding families, but it has some of the most deadly um, plants that you can harvest in that. Um, and also uh, foraging for plants, fungi, um, and uh, fruit, anything above ground, is perfectly legal in uh, any public area, and um, it's always wise to ask um, permission from the landowner which they probably wouldn't mind anyway, especially if you're taking their thistles and nettles and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, ask, ask permission just so you can um, go onto their properties to harvest. Um, and um, obviously avoid busy roadsides, um, sprayed field edges and urban polluted areas. Um, so, for, so for example, I mean, something that a lot of people will do is go out blackberry picking at the right time of year, but quite often blackberries will grow on footpaths in areas that are quite built up. Are they yeah. blackberries that we should avoid? Um, there's a bit of an argument lately actually saying that they're not too terrible to harvest, especially if you just give them a wash. Um, I think in a sense, if you're, if you're living in a city and you're eating intensively farmed food anyway, um, maybe if you have no choice or it's just not something you can't get hold of other things, wild food in the city is probably still better than eating Feel intensively sense. farmed yeah. produce. Just got to be careful of certain areas where they might have, mm. they might have absorbed all the road pollution things like that because certain plants can kind of take up the uh, heavy metals in the soil or um, other 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 yeah. ingredients now uh, we're going to finish with this you you're, i'm holding a leaf of sorrel that you've given me uh, do i need to try yes, it yes so basically sorrel is another plant that's it's in the dock family right um now the you can possibly mistake it for lords and ladies but generally they don't really grow in the same environment Fine. and the fundamental um difference is if you give it give it a little nibbles okay and what does it taste like Oh my word. <laughs> lemony. Yeah, it's um, almost like a fruit, isn't it? Yeah, it's like lemony because the doc, doc family, it's, uh, it's oxalic acid. Is this going on our pizza later? Um, that is, yes. Wow, oh, that is really... Um, so, so, so before, before we quickly um, end this, this session, th yeah. th this episode... Time this is part, against us. Um, it's, so, so the final part of foraging is using your senses and using a book that you can identify with. So the senses, your taste, your smell... Um, mm. and uh, and observing. They're big things that can aid you um, with wild food. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot more to go into with it, obviously, mm. um, but we're short for time to... And we've got <laughs> another two slots, so we'll do that yeah. later. Richard, thanks for now. Well, oh well we've talked on moving. We're going to make a pizza before nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> with sorrel on it. I can't wait for this. Thank you. Um, welcome back to the outskirts of Gayton, where I'm spending the morning with Richard Morby, forager extraordinaire. Um, it is a gorgeous morning over here, I have to say. There was a light drizzle earlier on, the sun is now peeping through some high cloud. It's twinkling off the wet leaves of a sapling about 10 metres from where I am standing outside the door of Richard's foraging caravan. And inside you can hear jars chinking and things like that because Richard is preparing a foraged pizza for us. Richard, how are you getting on? Um, yeah, doing good, thank you. Um, so yes, what, what we've actually just got so far now is I've just put the hawthorn base down. Um, what I will mention about hawthorn ketchup is it's so simple to create. If you just do a quick search on Google, it will come up with a recipe, but it's as simple as adding some berries to a bit of cider vinegar, some water, um, adding a little bit of salt and pepper to taste, and there you go. Um, I add a little bit of garlic myself just to give it that extra little And do you nice have kick. to cook it at all? Um, yeah, you, you, just... boil, you boil it down like you would do, like you just, you just boil it down till the berries kind of soften, mash it all up and strain it through a sieve. And I've just tasted some, and Annabelle, it tastes like, Hawthorne ketchup tastes like a sweet, slightly zingier apple tomato ketchup it tastes absolutely phenomenal so we've got that as the base um what else is going on the so pizza what we've Richard? got is some wild uh, mushrooms that i harvested myself um got some fairy ring champignons that i dried earlier in the year from up in the top field i've got some trooping funnels um which are uh, forage from down in down by the lake and i've also got some seps which are a very prized edible mushroom. Um, I managed to find some just before we came up, uh, just before the weekend, um, when I went looking for some in the, in some further away woods. Because Northampton, unfortunately, I haven't found any habitat yet that's ideal for seps. I hope to try and introduce some spores to the field eventually. Because um, I've heard of seps, yeah. and I'm aware well, that they're a bit like mushrooms. Well, porcini. Oh, are they seps? Yeah, the so same name. What is the difference then between a mushroom and a sep? They're this, basically a mushroom is a mushroom. They're just different different types. Though a sep is in the Boletus um, family, um, 
and I don't know. I mean, I didn't know what the big the big deal about was the taste till this year because I haven't been I haven't been able to find any myself till now. Yeah. But you can even nibble on these ones raw, and they're very um, hard to explain it. Really, they have a unique flavour, and I mean, you just have to try a set to kind of. Okay. Um, I so mean, they actually sell they sell them in the stores. To be honest. And, yeah. Um, but I mean, if you can find your own, yeah, then if you can even, find then, your then own, even yeah. better. I mean, there must be something quite satisfying in finding food that's free. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. And what we've also got for the uh, for the veg for the vegetable side of things, the wild plants. Yeah, we've got the common sole that we um, showed you earlier. The lemony stuff. Um, yeah, tastes amazing. and then we've got some dandelions, which have kind of like they have a bit of a bitterness about them, but they're they're a good bitter. Right. And um, and then I didn't forage any nettles, but I do have ground elder um, in here, which. Uh, which is a very invasive it's quite invasive in certain areas and um like ground elder is in the carrot family so you have to be aware of all the other carrot members that could potentially be toxic um like hemlock um etc but yeah. that, that doesn't necessarily look like ground elder um but if you can identify ground elder to all the toxic lookalikes then yeah great it's one of the it's mm. a real delicacy to add in the kitchen um now you mentioned earlier on that the kind of the good place for people to start they're listening this morning and they think i'd quite like to give foraging a go yeah. things like nettles and dandelions things that we would recognize yes from our that's, gardens that's right are good places to start yes and um, go go for the things that you already know that you can already identify so nettles dandelions um i mean even thistle root uh Again, you can't dig anything up unless it's your own property or you have permission. Um, but then, uh, but yes, so uh, any of the common wild, any of the common foods that we all usually deem as weeds, um, those are the easiest things to identify first, and they are also the most abundant. Hmm. Um, even chickweed, um, I mean, common sorrel. There's all these plants that grow everywhere, and even if all of us started foraging, there's hardly any chance we'll deplete any of those sources because they're so abundant yeah. yeah i mean the romans brought them here for a reason like the nettles and the ground elder yeah <laughs> so and the other thing we should focus on actually is focusing on invasive weeds invasive plants because those are the one thing that um, we're at the moment we're spraying with weed killer we're trying to eradicate them in other ways but japanese yeah. knotweed for example i mentioned earlier yes. on is, is edible listen it's, we're getting some messages in i, I, I think i wanted to give Annabelle a yeah. chance to read those so Annabelle, what have you got okay so you talk about japanese knotweed being um edible yeah. um so who's this peter who is a botanist and invasive weed expert no less based in toaster yes please make sure you know that japanese knotweed is only edible in early spring the fresh shoots look like right. asparagus, and even then only in small measures. And then David says, Annabelle, you must warn Tom that he mustn't eat blackberries after September because the witches pee on them. <laughs> Don't believe me? Try it. <laughs> OK. I mean, so we've got the yin and the yang messages more there. Yeah. <laughs> One of them is more serious. One of them's a little more silly, isn't it? Um, is there a time... Uh, Richard, we had an ex uh, a text from someone who's a Japanese knotweed expert and yes. says there are times of year when you should and shouldn't eat knotweed. That basically get it in the spring when it's early. If yeah, get it when get on, it when it's, it's early. Um, especially the young shoots, you can use them as you would with rhubarb. Mm. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Um, now uh, we, you've got a pizza to make, yes, man. Yes. So uh, I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you crack on and finish that because that needs to get in the oven. And uh, Annabelle, I'm just going to walk around the back of the radio car and just give you an idea. I mean, Richard has a lot of land to draw upon, which definitely helps him. But um, what an abundance of stuff is growing all around us. And you probably don't even realise that a lot of it might be edible. So do take care and go on courses. But nevertheless, it's, well, yeah, I'm, I'm having my mind blown a little bit. Can is you tell? The, I can. Is the pizza going to be ready for in the next half hour or so? Fingers crossed. Oh, God, I am hungry. Beats Just your wheat of doesn't it? Amazing been uh, doing our own bit of cooking this morning when well, I say we the royal we I don't know whether the cooking has happened yet but we'll cross back to Tom because he's spending the morning doing some foraging with someone who does this for a living teaches people all about foraging you're out in the countryside aren't you Tom near the village of Gayton yeah. I presume you're wearing wellies or walking boots or some such attire I have got walking boots on sit rep on the boots I, I have damp toes do you Okay. Sorry. Well, they're not a very That's good a nice quality walking them. boot, are they? I just haven't kept up the waterproofing on mm. them. But thanks very much for judging my footwear. <laughs> you got You got to keep up the waterproofing, haven't you? Although it never seems important midsummer, does it? And that's the key. <laughs> no, not really. I must spray my boots. <laughs> I think the pizza's coming. I think oh, the pizza's is it? Coming. Right. So this is. So quick. Shall I just yeah, briefly update? Yes. Tell us. Right. I mean, I, I've, I've eaten enough leftover pizza for breakfast in my time, Annabelle. I've never had a foraged pizza, but today that is changing because Richard Morby is a forager, as you said. He teaches other people how to forage he's got a huge well, basically a nature reserve 
at his place in Gayton, which he uses to teach people. But he goes off all around the country foraging and says that you can feed yourself predominantly, almost exclusively, on the stuff that you find. Um, there are do's and don'ts. There's obviously knowledge. You have to know 110% what it is that you're picking because some of it can be dangerous so it's very important not to just go off and do it randomly that is key it's also important to have permission of landowners but if you know what you're doing and if you know that what you're picking hasn't been sprayed with pesticide and you know what it is then you can get a varied and rounded diet predominantly from stuff that is basically free and readily available isn't that amazing now you'll hear some rattles that's because richard has just got back to his foraging caravan with the pizza i'm i mean i'm gonna take a picture of this richard this looks incredible so on a pyrex dish annabelle is a pizza it's about nine inches across um it's got beautiful melted cheese on the top a variety of mushrooms and some of the stuff that we were foraging for earlier on including that sorrel that had that lemony taste that i told you about um is, so while Richard just, cuts that up, it, ask away. I presume not all of it is foraged. You know, no, for so I mean, you dough. don't find sourdough growing no. in the wild, do you? And the cheese. Well, well done. Um, Richard, where's the cheese from? Um, the cheese is um, it's organic cheese. Um, it's the one thing that I do have to buy. Fine. Um, so you can, as long as it's organic or uh, good source, that's generally what I use. Okay, and Richard was saying, do you remember Charles Reader, who um, has the dairy farm down at Evenly, who um, judged the most attractive cow competition? I do you remember see a few him, years yeah. Back. So, um, so Richard Morby gets his uh, raw milk oh, from there. So the unpasteurized good. stuff that you can't buy in the supermarket, but you can buy from the gate. He gets milk from there. So, so you do you have to get some stuff from the shop. Some but, stuff, but not a lot. I mean, I'm not dependent on it in terms of if I suddenly had to rely on, um, if I had to suddenly rely on, um, I don't know. Say the say you were no longer able to access the supermarket, so I would be fine. Yeah, well, yeah, you'd Not certainly fare a lot better than me. <laughs> yes. if, yeah, if that if that ever happens, Richard, I'm moving in. That's what's <laughs> that's what's happening. So, quick uh, update, uh, Annabelle. Richard is just nicely carving it up on a. Oh, is this a slice? Yeah, this is a slice. Oh, here we go. I'm quite. I, I have to. How say, does I'm it look? Really, does it look I'm, good? It looks phenomenal. I'm going to tweet a picture of it in hot. just a second. No, no, no. That's fine. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's still lovely and warm. Thank you. Right. Are you ready, Annabelle? Yeah. I'm going in. Oh my word. That is amazing. Mm. It's so Annabelle. It's kind of, it is sweet. That's from the Hawthorne ketchup. Are you going back to the? Um, are you going back to the studio think, afterwards? Yes. I'll give you some to take back. Oh, Annabelle, you're gonna you're gonna get <laughs> wow, some. Um, come so on. it's sweet from the Hawthorne ketchup. <laughs> then there's the savoury and kind of meaty taste that comes from the wild mushrooms and sets. Um, the lemony, lemony kind of taste of the sorrel. What what else did you put on it, Richard? Um, there's dandelions and um, ground elder. Mm. Ground elder. That is amazing, what? isn't it? Now, just a word about ground elder. What is that? Oh, that's in that's in the carrot family. Um, it's quite an invasive um, invasive weed in, in many parts. Um, just make sure that you can identify the toxic members of the carrot family before you do pick something like ground elder. But um, otherwise, it's fairly easy to identify. It's one of the easier members of the carrot family to distinguish. I mean, Richard, I'm going to go out there and say this is the nicest pizza <laughs> I've ever eaten. Creep. What a I've creep. sold you that. I've sold you on wild food then. You have. <laughs> I mean, so if people are listening to this and they think, I fancy giving this a go, what, I mean, other than coming on one of your courses yes. and you're on Instagram and Facebook, people yeah. need to search for forage frolics. Sorry, I'm speaking with my mouth full. <laughs> what are the things that people should do? What are the starters? Um, just get out there, really. Just start walking in the woods, walking in the fields, um, just kind of observing what's around you. Um, so before you even get to the tasting part, just have a look at things, observe them, pick them, nibble, not nibble, sorry, pick them, observe them, smell them, crush them in your fingers. Um, get used to those initial sensory triggers first so you can kind of better identify plants when you get around to actually picking edible ones. Um, but it's just, it's just one way to connect to the natural environment that we've long kind of stopped doing. And where does this finish for you? What is your ambition, briefly? Um, I don't know, really. I'm just kind of, I do things that's the most optimal for my health, uh, also being a positive change in the world. Um, that's pretty much where I'm at and that's what I'm doing. Well, listen, uh, this has been one of the most eye-opening mornings I think <laughs> I've had in my job. So I really appreciate you letting me come over. Thank you You're ever so much. You're most welcome. Cheers, Richard. Cheers. Richard Morby, who runs Forage Frolics. You can find him online. And, um, well, if you want to just have a completely different way of looking at the landscape, then get in touch with him. Hang on, Annabelle, I'm going to tweet this. Okay. Um, Almost um, as eye-opening so, as when you got put in drag. Oh, 
just look, why do you keep coming back to that? I was trying to make a serious and profound point. Yes, more eye-opening than the time that I was dressed up as a woman, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> right, well, I'll wait to see the picture. I can't wait. Amazing. I can't believe you've had a, a pizza made up of the stuff that you have found this morning. Very well done, Tom, and thank you very much to Richard. It is Annabelle with you. Tom has been out and about today. He's been foraging, and, um, well, you've been foraging with success, haven't you, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 if I, I'd be lying if I said that the bulk of the foraging was done by me or that I brought any kind of expertise to the table. But yes, uh, we had a lot of success because I was with Richard Morby, uh, who runs a company called Forage Frolics. He's based on the outskirts of Gayton. He'll take you on a walk round Woodland and point out to you and help you identify the stuff that you can pull out of the ground and eat. There are do's and don'ts, obviously. You have to make sure that what you're eating is safe, that you're allowed to do it where you are, blah, blah, blah. But as long as you tick all the boxes and you do it safely, you can have something that tastes amazing and you have a slice of something amazing in front of you. I do. So you've popped this back for us. And actually, yeah. Andy... Mm. is here as well yeah. and you have got some as well haven't you because yeah. you can't come back to the studio Tom and bring me food and not Andy can mm. you he'd no, absolutely no. kill no. you no. right oh it's quite heavy isn't it so, so mine has gone yeah. cold Annabelle because I give you the tin foil to wrap it and keep it warm because I'm a nice person mm. oh my god that is amazing so tell isn't me what is on that oh wow so on that so so mm. the red where where the tomato base would be on a normal pizza that is what Richard called hawthorn ketchup. So you get hawthorn berries, which are similar actually to apples in consistency. And, and you boil them down as you would any berry if you're making a sauce or if you're making jam or something like that. And all he said he added was a bit of pepper, a bit of salt, a little bit of garlic and some cider vinegar. Mm. And that made the base. Then the, the, obviously the, the, the sourdough base is just sourdough and the cheese is just cheese. But everything else on there is foraged. So there's various wild mushrooms. The mushrooms seps, are lovely, which aren't are, they? Seps, which are similar to mushrooms and are a bit of a delicacy. They're quite hard to find, Richard was saying. Um, and then there was a, there's sorrel, which I tried earlier on and tastes really lemony. That's that kind of citrusy, zesty thing that you're getting. Mm. And some other bits of wild herbs and plants. And dandelion is on there, I think. Mm. I mean... When I said earlier on that it was the nicest pizza I'd ever tasted, Annabelle, you called me a creep at the I time. I did, yeah. Mm. Are you eating your words now? It's really, really good. It it's is really, really good. good. And the zesty mm. thing that you talk about, the zesty notes that we're getting, it does kind of feel like almost a sweet and sour mix because mm. there's the tanginess, I think, probably from the yeah. cider vinegar. Look you at know, you with that. your zesty notes. I know. Where mm. have you come right, from? I have some Dear knowledge. Gosh, yes. get you. Um, <laughs> whenever you say this to the topical song. <laughs> <laughs> whenever you say sorrel, all I can think of is the topical song that we did some time back on herbs when it was sorrel seems to be the hardest word, which mm. was one of my Absolutely. favorites. Um, um, so, I mean, oh. I have to say, I took from this, uh, I've learned a lot this morning. And that, to be honest, there were tons of stuff that Richard and I talked about off air that we didn't just just didn't have time to get into. Like the fact that Richard ate raw squirrel. Are you now, able to eat raw squirrel? What, like a carpaccio of squirrel. Oh, <laughs> yeah, like um, <laughs> like squirrel tartare. Or squirrel sushi. <laughs> wow. uh, yeah, basically. I'm not sure but he, about but the, that. But the point that he made <laughs> is ultimately, if you know where something has come from, and if you've been involved in it from start to finish, then you can do something like that with confidence. And he said also, you know, you will go to a restaurant and order beef tartare, or you'll order sushi, which has raw fish in it. So the idea of eating raw meat is not an alien concept. Mm. You just have to adjust your mindset and have the knowledge is the other key thing. So he does that. Is this um, the moment you tell us that Andy and I have just eaten raw squirrel? <laughs> 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 you have eaten raw? No, you haven't eaten raw squirrel. Do you know, I'm one of the people working on the programme today is vegetarian and I brought her a slice back as well. So if I was to say that for a joke, it would be even crueler. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty uh, no, sure. No it, couldn't that, that be like illegal? Isn't that like poisoning? <laughs> <if somebody's laughs> there's no meat on. Andy, there's no meat on the pizza. Chip, okay, pump okay. your brakes. Come Listen. On. So, uh, but the other thing that he told me is, I mean, on on his land, so that he lives basically on the edge of a nature reserve that's near his house or his parents' house. But anyway, um, there's a spring. And so for a year, he didn't drink tap water. He drank the water that came through the spring because it was clean water. And he mm. said the other thing that happens is if you do, f if once you forage and you do it regularly, as it becomes a regular part of or a significant part of your diet, it basically retrains your gut. 
So all of the microbes and the bacteria and the things that your gut uses to digest the food that we normal folk eat, that we buy from the supermarket or whatever, um, it diversifies because you're giving it a more natural, more nutritionally dense set of foods, is what Richard was saying. Mm -hmm. And so you can essentially train your gut, make it fitter, make your gut healthier, and then it can cope with a wider range of stuff. And that, that then is, is beneficial again. I feel like my it's gut been, could do with a bit of retraining. So, yeah. But does that mean that you have to go through a period of time where you're foraging and you're getting awful cramps and, and maybe things are flying out of places you don't want to live No, because you start off small. So you start oh, okay. off with the simple stuff like nettle soup and things like that. You don't, jump, you don't jump straight into peeling a squirrel and eating <laughs> you don't it. don't jump straight into raw squirrel. Well, that's good to know. Tom, thank you very much.